I've checked all the questions students reported in recent IELTS speaking exams and selected the three most difficult ones, two from part one and one from part three. In this lesson, you'll hear model answers and learn some useful vocabulary to help you improve your answers. It's Asia. Let's get started! Our first topic is ambitions. And the question is, do you consider yourself an ambitious person? I have two answers for you. Here is the first. Yes, I think I'm pretty ambitious. I mean, I always try to push myself to the limits in whatever I do. If you don't aim high, then you'll never realize your dreams. If that's a bit too much, here is the opposite answer. I wouldn't say I was particularly overambitious. I mean, I try to achieve my aims, but I think it's equally important to set realistic goals, things that are within your reach, that are achievable, even if I'm never the best at anything. Perhaps I don't have enough drive to get to the top. Are these answers long enough? Too long? What do you think? Well, in part one, you're going to be asked around 11 or 12 questions in just five minutes, including the identification part. This means around 20 seconds per question or two, three sentences. Short and to the point. In our answers, you might have noticed some interesting collocations or combinations of words. Some of these collocations are also idiomatic expressions, which, if you use them correctly and appropriately, can help you get a high band score. Let's have a look at them. Push yourself to the limits, to work very, very hard, aim high, to be very ambitious and try to be the best. Realize your dreams, make your dreams a reality. Overambitious is too ambitious. Achieve your aims. Succeed in something usually after a lot of effort. Set realistic goals means to have ambitions you know you can achieve. Drive is motivation, this personal desire that pushes you. Get to the top to reach the highest position possible in your studies or work. The next question is, what did you want to be when you were younger? Well, I always dreamt of becoming a doctor. I was inspired by my aunt who worked as a doctor in a big hospital and I wanted to make a difference just like her. But by my late teens, I completely abandoned the idea when I found out how long I need to study for. Here are some more interesting and useful collocations. Dream of becoming. It means you really want to be or do something. And notice the gerund, becoming. Be inspired by. It means to be influenced by a good example. And notice the passive voice. This story inspires me. I'm inspired by the story. Make a difference to have a significant effect on something. By the way, if you have access to the IELTS speaking library, you can download the updated version with the sample answers and vocabulary from today's video on your student portal. And if you don't have it, I'll leave the link in the description. This ebook covers over 40 challenging IELTS speaking topics. Okay, the next question is, do you have any goals or aspirations for the future? My short-term goal is to finish my master's and find a great job. After that, I haven't really thought that much. On the personal side, my one burning ambition is to try parachuting. That was my answer. So here is the vocabulary. A short-term goal is a plan for the near future. And a long-term goal is something you can accomplish over a long period of time, like 10 years. Burning ambition is something you feel you really want to do. Is it important for people to have ambitions? 
everybody should set themselves some targets in life. You can't just drift living from day to day without some kind of plan. Having aims in life gives you a purpose, something to strive for. To set yourself some targets means to establish aims for the future. Strive for something, to make a great effort to achieve something. Have you noticed the similarities between some words and expressions? Do we set or establish goals or aims or targets? How important is it to push ourselves or to strive for something we want? This variety shows the examiner how wide your vocabulary is, boosting your score. At the same time, I'm not trying to deliberately use some rare or formal words which would sound unnatural in a conversation. Okay, let's turn to our second part one topic, repairing things. And the first question is, are you good at fixing things? Again, I have two options for you. I wonder which camp you belong to, A or B. A. I'm pretty good at fixing most things around the house. I'm good with my hands and I have a toolkit with all you need, you know, screwdrivers and so on. So simple plumbing jobs like fixing a leaking tap or something similar I can do. But one thing I don't touch is electrics. Anything to do with wires scares me a lot. Answer B. I must admit I'm no handyman. In fact, I feel quite helpless when things stop working or break. I just call for help or buy a replacement. But I'm not bad at gluing broken pieces together. I managed to glue the handle on my favorite coffee cup recently. So maybe I'm not as bad as I thought. So, the vocabulary. Good with my hands, skillful at doing things, you know, with your hands. A toolkit is a box containing tools used for repairing things, screwdrivers and a hammer. One thing I don't touch, that's something you never do. I'm no handyman. A handyman is a person who's good at repairing things not bad at. If you're not bad at something, it means you're probably pretty good. And notice the gerund after at. I'm not bad at doing this. Has anyone ever taught you how to fix things? My grandfather was a skilled electrician and very practical at everything. He always told my sister and I how important it was to know how things work and what to do when they go wrong. It was him who showed me how to do simple jobs with fuses and how to open up electrical appliances like an iron when it stopped working. To be very practical is to be very good with your hands. Know how things work, like understand the mechanics or how machines function. When they go wrong, or the time when they stop working. Is there anyone in your family who's good at fixing things? Answer A. My father pretends he's good, but all he does is take things to pieces and then he never knows how to put them all back together again. That's why we now have quite a few broken gadgets, some headphones, a digital camera, an old Walkman, just lying around. Answer B. My mother. She's amazing. Whenever anything breaks or just stops working, she would do her best to put it right. It doesn't matter what. It could be gluing broken parts together, plates, toys, kitchen appliances, car mechanics even. She'll try her hand at anything. To take things to pieces is to separate something into parts, to disassemble. And to put them back together is to reassemble the parts. Gadgets are usually small electronic devices. And kitchen appliances are anything from a microwave to the fridge. Try your hand at anything to attempt anything. 
Next. Do you think it's necessary for people to learn how to fix things? I think it's very important that, at the very least, everybody should know the basics, because that kind of knowledge will always come in handy and will probably save you a lot of money too. To know the basics is to understand the fundamental principles of something, always come in handy. It means it will always be useful. Now I'd like to try something new. Usually we only cover part one topics, but this time I'm including a part three topic too. So let me know in the comments if you find it useful or not really. The topic is climate change. These questions in part three follow up a part two topic on environment. Climate change is always in the news these days. And now it's in IELTS too. Remember that the examiner will choose questions from two of three sets, the easier or the more difficult, depending on your performance to that point. The examiner will try to ask you five or six main questions and with um, some follow-up questions over five minutes. So let's look at some possible part three questions. Are there many environmental problems in your country? Yes, and it's all to do with climate change. What's been happening over the last few years is that, for one thing, the summers seem to be getting hotter and hotter. And also, the weather in general is becoming so unpredictable. It rains when it never used to, and these unusual weather patterns have had a catastrophic effect on farming. Entire harvests have been ruined, and that has led to food shortages and inflation. There has also been a lot of flooding in low-lying coastal areas and near rivers. It's really getting serious. Hotter and hotter. You can repeat the adjective for emphasis. Other examples. Worse and worse, better and better, have a catastrophic effect on. Collocations with have are very common. Notice the on after effect. And we can use different adjectives. Significant, enormous, tremendous, or the opposite. Negligible, insignificant. Do you think older people are as aware as the young when it comes to these issues? It's hard to say. and. It's unfair to generalize. We tend to associate the young with the more active protest movements. But um, a lot of older people do their bit too. For example, where I live, uh, there is this local voluntary group of mostly retired people who've set up a rescue center for animals caught up in wildfires in the nearby countryside. Fires brought about by record high temperatures. And these people are tackling the issue head on, while so many of us, young and old, do next to nothing. Do your bit. Do something useful. Make a contribution through your efforts. Tackle the issue head on. This means to take direct action to solve a problem. Do next to nothing. Do very little or make no effort. Next. Is enough being done, either in your region or worldwide, to deal with climate change? I don't think so. We've reached the tipping point, or we're getting very close to it. Just take the impact it's having on rising sea levels. If something isn't done right now, it will be too late to save the planet. Most of the blame lies with our dependence on fossil fuels. And if we don't reduce that dependence by investing in renewable energy sources, like solar panels. I just don't know what will happen. To reach the tipping point. The tipping point is the point of no return, when you can't reverse or change what's happening. The blame lies with. It means that's responsibility of someone or something, or it's their fault. Is international cooperation necessary to solve climate change issues? Of course, but it's not that simple. World leaders should be showing us the way, but 
as far as I can see, some of them seem to be in denial, saying that we have nothing to worry about. They have all these conferences and they all sign up to agreements about net zero carbon emissions and talk about protecting the rainforests and whatever. But then most of them break their promises afterwards. The outlook is not encouraging. Okay, let's talk about some vocabulary. To show somebody the way, to lead by example. In denial, this means you refuse to admit the truth or the reality of a situation. Sign up to something. This means to promise to do something by putting your signature on the document. So here are the examples of climate change vocabulary. It's just a sample. If you are asked to talk about this topic in the speaking test, nobody expects you to be an expert on the subject. But it's a good idea to be familiar with some terms. So here are some examples. Flooding. That's where rivers overflow or the sea rises and has occurred so often in the last few years. Wildfires. These are fires out of control, usually in areas where there are a lot of trees and they cause terrible destruction. Tropical rainforests, such as the Amazon, need to be protected against the effects of climate change and human exploitation, of course. Look again at the list. You can add more to it yourself. You don't have to be an expert, but it's good to know some topic-specific vocabulary. In the speaking library, you can find all the sample answers and vocabulary on this and over 40 other IELTS speaking topics and will regularly add new topics. It's a great resource if you have a bit of time before your exam and you want to improve your speaking skills. I'll link it in the video description. Arguably, part three of the speaking test has more effect on your score than part one. The last impression is stronger than the first. So if you'd like to improve your part three answers, watch this video here. And thank you so much for watching me today. Good luck with your preparation and your exams.